So bringing the attention to the here and now, just observe, you know, the state of mind you're in. Just, uh, not to criticize it, but just recognize it's like this. And that sign over there, it's like this. And so it's reminded just to, so that, you know, you're, you're establishing this here and now uh, practice because when we, we tend like say the oh, water uh, then we kind of expect something or we maybe we you know we have a reaction to just the idea of having something having a meeting or you know what or whatever how these words affect you you know whether they inspire you or you, you feel rebellious or indifferent it's you to, it's up to you to know that it's like this and so you're you're establishing this awareness around the way it is not you know so it's not um, you know not a critical there's no you know you should feel a certain way or that you should you know appreciate this and and or you shouldn't complain about it or you should pay attention or whatever because of, these are the notice the shoulds of life about how things you know we can always imagine how life should be uh, but to really be aware of how it really is at this moment it's like this and so we can you know we can uh, you know, one can be easily intimidated in monastic life through all the shoulds about, you know, the, the, the contentment, gratitude, uh, surrender, all these uh, terms we have, uh, you know, are their, their directions rather than commands. You can't command or order somebody to be grateful or contented or to agree with everything or like everything or you can't just order them to surrender and and anyone they can't really do you know you can say surrender but whether somebody actually can do it or not something else so that's up to to and this, so this is like the reflective practice to be aware of how things like to the vinaya how the rules of the vinaya affect you or uh, the this lifestyle in the monastery, the the head monk or the other monks or lay people is like to be aware of it. It's like this at this moment, because of course it changes. We have different, we feel differently at different times. But the point of this reflection is to encourage this, this observing. <coughs> Uh, reflectiveness that, I, that you know is really buto really awakened attention to the way it is and, and, and again I emphasize it's not critical not saying if you're feeling in a terrible mood and and full of anger and resentment that you shouldn't feel like that you know because if that's what you're feeling uh, at this present moment that's maybe not even the way you want to feel but that's the conditions in your karma have arisen to where this is what you're feeling so the important thing is to be aware of it and in this way then you're seeing it as uh, you know as it really as it, as, as it really is in the present you know you're feeling that you're no, knowing that it's like this so so like anger for example <clears throat> You know when you feel angry, don't you? I mean, we all know when I some put something. I feel I have this mood, angry mood. I I know. I say, well, I'm angry. I feel angry. So there's a kind of knowing of it. You know, it's it's uh, you know it's a mood. It's very strong. Anger is one of the strong emotions. But then, but then, uh, even though you you know you're feeling angry, you, you're interpreting it always from. Uh, you know, a very personal way. It's my anger, or it's, it's 
or we blame it on somebody else or something else. So we, even though we know there's anger, we, we claim it as it's caused by somebody, it's, uh, it's mine, and uh, maybe we w- don't want to try to get rid of it, or we completely kind of get lost in it and, and uh, proliferate on the, on the uh, angry energy. But the middle way, the Majjhima Bhattibhattha, is the, the knower of it, it's like this. And apply that to, <clears throat> I mean, anger is easy to see, uh, sexual lust is easy to observe, you know, you know, when that kind of energy is present. Uh, so, so greed, lopa and dosa are, are quite easy to, you know, because they're strong energy. But so much of our life is spent around the moha level of uh, just feeling indifferent or bored or, you know, slightly anxious or worried. Mild cases of it, mild types of emotions, which, you know, are easy to, to, to just not notice. Because they, they aren't important enough, they aren't strong enough to... to uh, you know, be aware of. But in this, in this Lopa Dosa Moha sequence, you know, greed, hatred, and illusion, uh, these are the, you know, these, these are categories of, of different uh, emotional reactions we have uh, in, in this realm and, and as a human being. And then, of course, uh, anger can be, you know, just being kind of just annoyed or irritated to, you know, murderous rage from you know, a total commitment to to violent act or or just just being, you know, fed up and irritated with with something or somebody or even yourself. And then greed, of course, is different levels of, you know, it's not always sexual desire, but it's all, you know, wanting uh, sensual pleasures. And, and then we live a life of renunciation. So, so we can feel that we shouldn't want sensual pleasures and, and then try to, you know, judge ourselves according to, you know, try to stop this uh, sensual uh, pleasure experience, but also it's uh, it's knowing it for what it is. This attraction to pleasure through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching is like this. So you know, in Vedana Nusati, uh, on Vedana, you're aware of the pull of the of the, uh, of what is attractive and pleasing on the sensual level. And then what is repulsive? What is, you know, you don't like, don't want. They're like uh, a super practices and things like that. It's, it's kind of a deliberate uh, willingness to uh, observe feelings of aversion and repulsion toward sense, sense experiences. This uh, and then the moha level is, I found just being kind of confused, the general emotional confusion or indifference or or kind of levels of boredom or mild forms of negativity that uh, that can you know so much of one's life tend to be ignored or or in a, in a busy life, in an ordinary life, there's so many distractions, you know, when you get bored or, you know, unhappy or whatever, then you can, you can distract yourself through, through sensual indulgence or uh, sexual fantasy or television, uh, telephone, uh, or whatever, you know, there's so many possible interesting distractions now, the internet, and there must be, you know, fantastic variety of 
entertaining, interesting distractions just uh, at the touch of, of a finger on a keyboard and there you may be worried or kind of bored and then you, you, you don't bother to notice you just it just the habit is to seek something that's interesting or distracting from a kind of dreary so much of of life can be rather dreary it's neither exciting or interesting or horrible or miserable but it's it's just wearisome and boring and and dreary so so my modern life is to to snap out of that by finding something exciting interesting and pleasing why do people go go to uh, horror movies why do you know why do why do people horror movies are very popular nowadays they they seem to be, be obsessed with vampire movies <laughs> You know, so I think, why why is this sudden kind of re- fashion and fascination for vampires? And <laughs> and uh, when they make these vampire movies, they're very, you know, they're money makers. And, and uh, of course, vampires are, you know, being scared is exciting, isn't it? Being uh, frightened out of your wits. <laughs> and... Uh, and kind of gore and blood and war. Sex and violence are excite the, the human mind. Football, you know, why why is it a world obsession with football? Because it's exciting. You know, you see these two teams uh, kicking a ball around the field. <laughs> and then people get very excited and and uh, you know they really get passionate <laughs> really passionate over you know Manchester United or something <laughs> and so it's uh, you know why, what, what is it in, in why do we do that you know seeing, seeing men kicking the ball around what you know except that it is takes us out of the realm of boredom and maybe the dreariness of our life you know, the weariness of existing and the unpleasant job we have or maybe we we don't get along with the wife or something and so you can find distraction through through these exciting events and wars are always exciting isn't it? fighting and boxing and <coughs> So it's like contemplating excitement. What is exciting and romance, romantic uh, images? You know, it's a different uh, kind of emotion and adventures, romance, adventure, excitement. And that, but when you really look at anyone's life, you know, any you know, ours or lay people or anyone, it, it's really the moments of great romance, adventure, excitement are rare. Most of it's like this. this sleepiness, boredom, indifference, uh, dreary feelings, uh, just routine life. Getting up in the morning, putting on your clothes, going through your job, waiting for the bus, that's what most of life is really about, isn't it? That's, when you look at most of the moments of anyone's life, it's, it's just that kind of experience. The ordinary routine. But in monastic life, you know, we want to, you know, it is a, a boring lifestyle, so it, it's, uh, it's deliberately constructed to, because it, in this way we have to pay attention to what we're feeling. You know, it's encouraging. It's like this, what I'm trying to do now. It's kind of encourage you to look at at the way you're feeling. You know, if it's dreary or bored or disillusioned or or critical or whatever, it's it's to be the knower the way it is. It's like this.
and then we, of course, then we, the, it's so easy to make a judgment, like, it, you know, to think we, you know, the, the, it's, it's wrong the way we're feeling, or it's not good enough, or we've got to do something about it. But this is where it, it's a real act of trust or faith in this awareness to be just, it's like this, and, and just, ex, you know, this kind of patient allowance of it to be what it is in the present, without jumping in trying to change it, criticize it, or or blame it on somebody. There's also another another way of just listening uh, to it. So you you know like like um, my background is we we were you know we tend to complain about things. Every you know life that you brought up to complain, and then I was in the navy for four years, and there was four years of relentless, unmitigated complaining. So uh, in the navy, and even when everything was okay, people still complained. So, so you know, and and then of course in the military, there's always. You know, it's it's not a particular li- a lifestyle that that you can love totally. It, there's a lot to complain about, but even when there isn't, the habit of complaining, grumbling, is uh, be- it becomes addictive. So even when when life is uh, isn't is going quite well, then we still tend to there's still a tendency to complain about it in some way or another. So, because this was uh, such a strong habit, you know, when I first came to live in uh, with Lung Kwan Cha, you know, the complaining mind would take over. And why did they have to do it like this? Oh, grumble, grumble. And fortunately, you know, nobody could speak English and I couldn't speak the language, so I didn't, at least I didn't complain to others. And, and when I did, then I'd get called in front of Ajahn Chah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I, and I, I, you know, I, but I was grumbling internally. I started listening to it. Listening to this, this kind of, and I realized it was a, just a habit of grumbling. And, uh, and so it, it just went on, you know, because that's, habits are like that, you know, they, you just, Develop these habits, and then they they kind of take you over, and, and and they come up, you know, no matter what, because they're that's what habits do. So uh, you know, then the ideal bhikkhu image was one who's content and grateful, not one who complains. So then, then trying to make myself content uh, through you know, through an act of will, couldn't do that either. Couldn't, couldn't just pretend I'm contented. Or I'd feel I should be, and then feel worthless that I'm not very good bhikkhu because I'm, I'm not content or grateful. I just grumble and complain. Or then this bhutto practice of listening, paying attention to it. The discontentment listen to to discontentment rather than trying to just get rid of it or go along with it or feel guilty about it listen to grumbling, internal grumbling complaining, whinging that goes on, it's like this and then you then you begin to to get this sense of this which is aware of the aramana or the object is this is this is aware this is intelligent awareness this is pure this is uh, refuge and the object then is seen uh, you know rather in terms of pers- personalizing it and, and and judging it but seeing that in terms of all sankaras are impermanent and non-self. So it really, it is a, it's a continuous 
determination to use just the conditions of the present moment for this developing this this practice, integrating it into your life, because it is not necessary to have everything, you know, to be sitting for a long period of time, but it, it's so much of, you know, life is about walking and standing and and washing your bowl, putting on your robes, going on the alms round, walking back to Kuti, uh, washing the robes and the daily routine of a monk, uh, in which, you know, we can listen, we use everything, you know, the here and now Dhamma as a way of listening to the way it is. And then this discerning ability, that which is aware of the way it is, of the condition that is operating now, is that which is aware of that condition is not a condition. It, it, does, it does, doesn't complain, it doesn't criticize, but it certainly discerns it. Because it's like anger, you know, there's anger. It discerns it, recognize anger. <clears throat> and so that is like mindfulness, that's Bhutto Tamo Sankho, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So you, you know, it's Buddha that knows Dhamma. So we 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 take refuge in Buddha rather than in our own particular views and opinions and personal uh, habits. Knowing Dhamma then is is knowing, or you know, uh, not through attachment to the idea of all conditions are impermanent, but by observing impermanence being the knower of impermanence, not someone who atta- attaches to the idea of impermanence. Because that's, we tend to do that easily, you see that a lot, you know, everything's impermanent, so, you know, everything ceases and, you know, then we think we've, we've got it all down and it's just, we're, we're, we're just quoting from the text or what our own opinion and it's right, and everything is impermanent, but the point is the grasping of the word. You see, it's not about grasping the idea of impermanence, but observing, this direct, insightful knowing of impermanence means that you actually can be aware of everything, you know, of the good qualities, the bad ones, the boring ones, the exciting ones, the dreary ones, they're all grist for the mill, it's all path knowledge by seeing, by knowing them as they really are. And then, you know, in my own practice I reached a point where, you know, really, you know, I really, this powerful sense of knowing and and then uh, but still the habit tendencies would would operate and there was a kind of hoping that that more mindful I was uh, the all these the irritating habits I have would disappear <laughs> so there was also uh, you know a wish to get rid of them or not you know the this kind of wanting not to have bad habits irritating habits is another object in consciousness, you know, not wanting and hoping that by practicing like this they'll go away. So, you know, then this continuous reminder of there's only the here and now, there's not, there's no past or future. Uh, the illusion of a past and, and the illusion of future is the rising in the present. So you can, you know, you you observe how you you're looking forward to something in the future, or or this idea of the future is it's beginning to become an object in the in the present moment rather than uh, just taken for granted and operating with always living now and doing something to get something you desire in the future.
So anatta then is when there's pure awareness, there's no self. You know, you can't claim my personality. Can't claim anything. I mean, it can claim all kinds of things. I don't believe it. The personality is never going to get enlightened. So, you know, when you think, you know, you go around judging Kuba Ajahn, who's enlightened and who isn't, because maybe maybe you don't like their personalities. He couldn't be enlightened, he's got a rotten personality. (laughs) It really, the personality, uh, you know, it doesn't get enlightened. So it, it, uh, we all have to, you know, we manifest through, you know, these personalities that we do have. <coughs> but the, um, so each uh, Kuba John, every monk has a, you know, it's different. They're not, you don't get a, an Arahant personality, you know, where they just, a state of bliss and saintly all the time but uh, you know we can imagine an arahant personality but you know that doesn't make sense because its personality is is a condition it's karma and then we relate you know like Ajahn Chah had a very kind of charming personality and ebullient and kind of outgoing and and radiant, and then Lumpur Liam is is very different. You know, he doesn't even look at you most of the time. But different personality, you know. Then uh, and then people judge. You know, they used to compare Lumpur Liam with Ajahn Chah. Oh, he's not like Ajahn Chah. <laughs> and uh, because they, you know, they they had this idea that, that to be enlightened, you have to be like Ajahn Chah. And then there's Lung Tapu, it's a very different personality, and all these others. So, you know, the conceit of, you know, because I like this monk and I don't like that one, that I'm, you know, I'm the judge of their, of their insight, is a, is a really, you know, really look at it, it's a very conceited position to take. That, that I'm, you know, I'm the, I know who's enlightened and who isn't. Is uh, is uh, you know when when you look at that in yourself, you don't. It sounds awful when you hear yourself thinking like that. And then uh, uh, the the oputo practice is that the the personality then is doesn't mean you don't have any personality, but you are no longer uh, operating from from that illusion. You know, it's no longer. A, you know, when we're unenlightened, when we're not aware, then we operate on a very personal level with everything. Everything's personalized, and 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 of course, we have to live our lives in this form for a lifetime with this body and this and these uh, habits that one has acquired condition you know so we and each one of us is you know has different karmic tendencies different problems different emotional hang-ups and tendencies and hopes and expectations fears and and that so that on that level there's you know there's very little possible chance of us all becoming exactly you know one kind of ideal mark but that's the point of the Vinaya is that it, it it's not about uh, you know trying to become uh, a good monk through through keeping rules and and being celibate but it's it's about an agreement on how to live with each other so we can have this occasion to observe the vipaka kama that we're experiencing in the present is like this. Now, in your lives, also, you're going to have to go through all kinds of uh, successes and failures, and uh, that's just a part of life, you know. So, in in um, 
monastic life doesn't get you out of that uh, but it but it does give you it's a, it does help you to observe praise and blame success and failure and good health and bad health and happiness and suffering you know the, so it's not to be you know we're not to to grasp these conventions uh, uh, at, in a, some kind of personal way but to use them for mindfulness reflection and then to the, you know the way we can actually live together as sangha because sangha always implies a group doesn't it it's not an individual it's not a hermit you don't take refuge in in in, in you know in a hermetic lifestyle it's, the third refuge is always sangha which implies a group of people so then uh, and so, you know, we have to live with each other uh, and then we, you know, we react to each other emotionally and, and that. But then the point of it all is, is that our, we're observing that, being the knower of the world rather than the worldly person trying to, to make the world fit an ideal that might be very beautiful, but would be an impossibility. You know, I can imagine a world that is extremely beautiful, but um, that's not the way life has ever been. I could imagine perfect monastery. And so, uh, you know, how I'd like a monastery to be, a, a really perfect high forest tradition monastery I can imagine it but I've never been able to make it manifest <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is where it, it's uh, you know the, wherever, whatever monastery you go to you're going to find you know something you know irritating frustrating or unpleasant about it uh, and some things you like some things you don't like but but the the issue is really of being aware of that. And after my first pansa with Lung Po Cha at Wat Pa Pong, I didn't particularly like uh, living in in the community. So I finally got permission to go off to Dong because uh, I had this idea of wanting to to live like a hermit. So I, at first, Anjan Chao wouldn't, wouldn't let me go, and then I thought, he's just trying to hang on to me, you know, just, just trying to control me, you know. He's <laughs> trying to control me. Power, you know, he's after power. You know, he wants to, to keep this prop around as a power symbol, you know, that I've got control over this big, clumsy American bloke. Lung Po Cha never said that. <laughs> and that's how the mind can work, you know. And then finally, uh, he did give in and let me go. And it was very amusing because I obviously he didn't want me to, to go, but he did it very graciously. And then the day I was to leave, um, I was going to go uh, up to Nongkai where I ordained and then to Sukhul Nakorn province where I had this place all set up up in the Pupan range Pupek mountain and so anyway uh, Ajahn Chah took me to the Warren train station along with a whole uh, truckload of other monks from Wat Bap home and uh, they put me on the train and then Lung Cha said very you know, come back for the pansa, and I said, yeah, I'm probably I didn't commit myself, <laughs> and so I, and I had this vision as I was pulling out of the Warren train station. I was there, and there the pochal was standing, and all the monks they were going like this, smiling at me. So I had that last image of leaving Warren with these wonderful monks waving goodbye or you know in the monastic place <laughs> and so then I went to Pupek 
mountain for six months and I was expecting you know bliss and happiness and it was quite a beautiful place and and uh, and then there were two Thai monks with me at, uh, on top of this mountain it was it's the highest peak in the Pupan mountain range uh, that goes across Circle Nakorn and it had it used to be a Khmer uh, Angkor Wat period type Chedi or something the ruins of it are still there so I was there and uh, the Bidnabot was very arduous you had to leave at dawn and go down this uh, you know this mountain which was quite a distance and wait at this reservoir in a little tin uh, hut for the villagers to come and they they bring food and put it on boats and we'd have to climb back up the mountain so we'd get there just in time to eat the meal before noon and uh, so from dawn until you know about 11, 11.30 they were just going to Bindabar and waiting for for this food and then uh, I mean to climb back up and uh, and then the, the, somebody put a sign halfway up this mountain, you know, somebody uh, put a sign in English saying, to do good is the same as climbing this mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this was about halfway up the mountain, and I thought, well, that's true, I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> halfway up, you're pretty tired, and you haven't had anything to eat yet. So <laughs> <laughs> do good is they was climbing this mountain I thought yeah it's true you know and too good is let's take a little more effort than just to not bother doing anything so anyway during that time everything horrible that you can imagine happened to me uh, I was arrested by the police and taken into the district because they thought I was a communist <laughs> and then uh and we had a terrible storm that blew, nearly blew my cootie off the cliff. Yeah. And in the kitchen, which was across from my cootie, that kitchen was blown right into my cootie. A wild, you know, like almost a uh, whirlwind. Hmm. And then, uh, then I became obsessed with aversion towards one of these Thai monks. And uh, not that he ever did anything to deserve it it just became totally obsessed with and I couldn't get rid of this hatred for this monk and and fortunately he he would come and go he wasn't there all the time but you know I was expecting peace and happiness instead I was just fulminating with this stupid emotion you know because it he hadn't done anything. Where did it come from, you know? Except that somehow anger and, and resentment was kind of fixed on this one monk. And then, uh, and then I uh, got very sick. I had terrible fever and they had to, to take me down. The village men came up and had to carry me down this mountain to this tin shelter but in the hot season and and I was so miserable I couldn't you know I just couldn't eat and the food was very kind of really coarse you know bun hot type food and and then this little shed it was hot season the sun would come blazing down on this tin roof and I'd be laying there you know totally I'm feeling terribly sorry for myself and all these insects crawling in all, you know, the eyes and the ears and these little, what do you call it? What? What I mean. And so, uh, and then I'd hear airplane flying overhead and, and I kept thinking, I'm going to die here. I'm, I'm, I'm dying and, and I've wasted my life. You know, then I, I could think of that plane, you know, it's going to, well, I could, 
go back to the States. I could get out of here, but I didn't even have the energy to do that. And then one of my friends, we were in the Peace Corps together, was uh, teaching English up in uh, Laos in Vietnam. Oh, he, you know, he's got a nice flat and <laughs> his own car and making money. And here I am, you know, a skeleton with all these insects crawling in and out of the, my orifices, sick, lonely. And then, uh, and then uh, they brought in a doctor who came in on horseback. There were no roads in. So he gave me some kind of injection. But then as I was lying there, one, one morning, I, I just, an inner voice, I heard this thing within me say, sit up and practice on a panasati. So here I had been lying there, I'm so sick and, and lonely and feeling sorry for myself. There. So I sat up and I started just doing on a panasati. And... Uh, Within a few days, I was all right. So, <laughs> so then, that impressed me because I did learn. You know, you could see I had to go through all these miserable states and and really suffer from them in order to see what I was actually doing. You know, so because I couldn't do anapanasati before, even though I, I should do it, but I'm just so weak. You know, I can't even be mindful of my breath, and what's the point of it anyway? And then, and then you, and then there's something in me that said, you know, shut up and practice. So I did, and then that, from that point on, it was, you know, I, I went back up to live in the top of the mountain, and uh, and it was getting near Vasa, Pansa. And my robes were in tatters, and uh, and I thought, and then I had this image of Lung Po Cha and the monk standing in the morning train station, <laughs> and I just couldn't get back to Wat Bap Phong fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> so that, and then they didn't have a kuti for me. So. They put me in one of the little sala. They had the, the first sala they ever built there. It was called the little sala, and, and so here I was in a little sala with about three or four other Thai monks. And they said, well, "I don't know if we have a kuti. You'll probably have to stay here." And at that time, I didn't care. I was just happy to get back. And but you know, just uh, to um, you know, I did learn. You know, all my efforts, you know, this sense of me trying to make things happen and me, you know, it was all that, that whole six months was just a, a kind of obsession with myself and my ideals of what I wanted. And, and that six months was probably the worst six months of my monastic life. <laughs> so when, when I went back to Wat Ba Pong, I was I'm more appreciative of <laughs> of Lung Po Cha and and the whole lifestyle that we live there. And so this is this is an example of of you know willing to learn from suffering. And don't 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 you know? I found also attitude of wanting to you know. There's such a strong resistance to suffering or or wanting to get rid of suffering that uh, I developed a practice about welcoming suffering because it's a kind of like a upaya where you know I, I just want bliss and happiness and then and then then uh, as you probably experience it being jawa now uh, uh, there's so much demand on you you know people are we've got to do this and then we've got to go there and then they're having this meeting and then this and that and then oh no not another not another thing no god no, no not another complaint no and then the welcome <laughs> complain all you want <laughs> 
And I thought <laughs> I found that helpful way of, of of dealing with it, you know, with my own tendency to to uh, not want that, you know, to want something that 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 you know where I feel safe and secure and everything's going well. And uh, but sometimes that that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But also, uh, this realm is like this. It's a, it's an irritating, frustrating experience from birth to death. So it's never going to be really what you want. But it's always, always going to be the way it is. <laughs> 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 I'll stop here. <laughs>